Thanks very much for inviting me. And uh, apologies that my, my French isn't good enough to give this talk in French. It's not even borderline good enough, unfortunately. And also apologies that because of the afternoon's activities, you've been forced to, to come an hour earlier than, than usual, which I think is almost as, as brutal a, a change in the morning as uh, being forced to change one's morning newspaper. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I think, I think perhaps the, the, the best thing for me to, to do at the beginning of this talk, actually to, will, will take quite a lot of time, is simply to uh, explain the, the title. Um, and I'll, I'll explain it um, word by word, starting from the, from the right. Um, as Max said, this, this, this talk is, in a way, um, a, a follow-up to some ideas in, in my book, Knowledge and Its uh, Limits, but I'm, I'm not going to assume that, that you've read the, the book. I'll try, I'll try to um, give you an idea of, of the relevant uh, things in it. Um, when one thinks about... The, the idea of rationality. Um, it's, it's very tempting to think that whatever rationality demands of you, uh, you must be in a position to know that it demands. Because rationality is supposed to be uh, uh, so we're a kind of um, dimension of assessment which takes into account the limitations on the agent's information. Um, and so if, if rationality made some demand on you that you were not in a position to know that it made, then it seems you could hardly be blamed for not meeting that demand, simply because you weren't in a position to know that it was being made. And yet that doesn't seem to be the way that we want the, the concept of rationality to, uh, to work, um, because uh, it, rationality is supposed to take into account the limitations on your knowledge. Uh, and so um, any, any failure to be, to be rational should be one that you can't be excused from by uh, ignorance. And so we've got this principle in the case of rationality that um, not a principle that I'm endorsing but one I'm saying is very tempting that um, if rationality demands that you do something then you're in a position to know that it uh, demands that, that you do that thing. And if you're tempted by that, you're likely to be tempted by a whole lot of associated ideas. For example, that if something is part of your evidence, then uh, you must be in a position to know that it's uh, part of your evidence. Um, because what your evidence is feeds into the demands of rationality, because you're supposed to be, other, other things being equal, um, proportioning your beliefs to the evidence available to you. Um, and so that suggests defining a general notion of a, what I call a, a luminous condition. So we'd say that a condition C is, um, is luminous if and only if um, whenever you satisfy C, you are in a position to know that you're satisfied. See. The, the, the reason for putting these words in a position to know is just to take account of the fact that you might not have asked yourself the question um, whether you satisfied C. Um, the thought might not have occurred to you, but the idea is the knowledge that you satisfy C is available for you as soon as the question arises. Um, and of course, all sorts of 
conditions have been claimed to be luminous. Um, I mean, there's a long tradition in philosophy of mind um, that lots of mental states constitute luminous conditions. For example, that if you're in pain, then um, you're in a position to know that you're in pain. Um, I mean, you could either think of that as an independent source of the idea that there are luminous conditions, or uh, I suspect that there's some connection between that and the original thought in that um, the, the considerations about rationality give one um, a reason to, to postulate some realm of luminous conditions, and then, it, as it were, at least superficially, it seems that all sorts of mental states are the best candidates for constituting such conditions. Um, okay, so, so that's, the, uh, that's the idea that, the, that, that there's some non-trivial domain of conditions that are luminous in that sense. The, the anti-luminosity um, comes from uh, an argument that I gave in Knowledge and Its Limits, or if you like, a kind of argument schema, really, which is supposed to be a very general way of arguing that virtually no non-trivial condition is luminous. Um, and let me just sketch the, the general idea of, of the argument. So what we do is we, I mean, we take any, any condition C which is supposed to be luminous, uh, and then we, we're going to try to argue by reductio ad absurdum that it's not. Um, and so we, we consider an example um, of some very gradual process where at one end of the process, um, would be the beginning, um, we have clear cases of C. For example, clear cases where you're in pain, clear cases where you're feeling cold, whatever it is. And then as think the underlying factors gradually change, you end up with a, a clear case of not C. Um, but the idea is that this is a very, very gradual process of change, and there's a, a limit to the, the subject's powers of discrimination so that we can divide this time period up into a whole lot of short intervals, starting from T0 and going to Tn, um, where, in a sense, to be explained, the, the change between time ti and time ti plus 1 at any point in the series is below the subject's threshold for discrimination. And the, and the way that I develop that is through the following claim, that um, if uh, at time ti, you, you know that you satisfy C, um, then at Ti plus 1, you do satisfy C. Not necessarily that you know that you do, that, that, um, but simply that you do satisfy it. Okay, the, the reasoning behind this condition is that if, if you did not satisfy condition Ti plus 1 at C, your... Sorry, sorry, I said I'd say it wrong. If, if you did not satisfy condition C at Ti plus... Yes, thank you. Uh, condition, if you did not satisfy condition C at Ti plus 1, sorry, um, then your belief at time Ti that you satisfy C would not be reliable enough to constitute knowledge because 
the, the difference between these two is below your threshold of discrimination, so the degree of confidence that you have that you satisfy C is going to be almost the same. It needn't be exactly the same, but almost the same at these two, uh, two moments, which might only be a millisecond apart. Um, in the book, I, I give a much more developed version of that argument, um, and, but I really just for now, I just want to give you what the, the general sort of idea behind it is. So we've got this condition here. Um, and something else that we, we need to build into the, the example is that this is a case where you're actually thinking about whether uh, you satisfy C. So uh, we don't need to bother about this condition that of being in a position to, uh, because uh, if you're in a position to know whether you satisfy C in, in this series, you do know that you satisfy C because the this was only a qualification put in to deal with cases in which the question didn't arise, whereas we're considering a case where the question does arise. Okay. Um, I should emphasize, by the way, that this condition here is just part of the description of the example. It's not intended to be some kind of law or anything like that. It's just something that we're drawing out of the particular nature of the, the gradual process that we've described. Now, if we put these, these two things together, the, the supposition that C is luminous and this condition here together, we get a reductio uh, ad absurdum. Because if we assume that um, at Ti, you satisfy C, then by the supposition that C is luminous, we, we also have that at Ti, um, you know that we satisfy C. And therefore, by this condition, we have that at Ti plus 1, we satisfy C. Okay, so we've, we've shown that if you satisfy this condition at one mo moment in the series, you satisfy it at the next moment in the series. But of course, that's a disaster because you do satis satisfy it at time t0. And so by applying this argument over and over again, we get the conclusion that you satisfy it at time tn, whereas tn is a paradigm of a case in which you do not satisfy the condition. And so therefore we've got a reductio ad absurdum of these two assumptions, but I argue that this, this assumption could be strongly supported, and therefore it, it must be the other assumption, the assumption that C is luminous, that has to be rejected. That's the general structure of the anti-luminosity uh, argument. Of course, it, almost certainly it will remind you of a Sarites series, and, and that might make you worry that some kind of cheating is going on with vagueness here. That's, that's a worry that I, I talk about at some length in the, the book. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about it now, but I think you'll see that the, the things that I'm going to go on to say give you an additional reason for thinking that it's not really a problem about vagueness. Okay, so that explains the, the anti part of the problem. Now the probabilistic part. Um, <coughs> something that I'm defending in Knowledge and Its Limits, and which I very much want to continue to defend, is the idea that the, the concept of knowledge is absolutely central to uh, epistemology, not simply as, um, by etymology, but um, by the uh, as it were, underlying philosophical facts. Um, but that's certainly something that you can have all sorts of doubts about, because um, you might think, I mean, I th this is not such a, an unusual view, that um, the concept of knowledge is uh, as we're part of folk epistemology, and that just as folk theories of all sorts of things need to be replaced by proper scientific theories, um, so folk epistemology needs to be replaced by uh, scientific epistemology. 
Um, and it, that might make you worry about the, the anti-luminosity argument, it, actually in two ways. Um, one way you might worry about it is you might worry that the argument draws <coughs> on <coughs> intuitions specific to the folk concept of knowledge, which are in some way mistaken. So you might think, for ex and in particular the way that that might come out is you might think that this condition here, which is crucial to the argument, um, is one that maybe is somehow built into the, uh, the folk concept of knowledge, but isn't really true. Um, the other way that you, you might worry in this sort of uh, spirit about the argument is you might think, all right, well, perhaps the argument is correct about the concept of knowledge, but the concept of knowledge is not sufficiently interesting for that to be a significant result because it just shows some kind of idiosyncrasy of a folk epistemological concept, which isn't really going to um, have any, anything corresponding to it in a properly uh, scientific epistemology. Um, typically, people who want to replace the concept of knowledge and folk epistemology by something that they regard as more scientific would think of some kind of probability-based epistemology as the, the best candidate to replace it. What I want to do with the considerations of this paper is to, is to argue that, in fact, the anti-luminosity argument can be reproduced within a probabilistic concept, a context, so that it shows that the anti-luminosity considerations are not some, as it were, pathology of folk epistemology, but something with a much deeper and more robust significance than that. Now, can I just yeah, ask you, sure. When, when Paul raised one question, is it, is, does it matter at all for assumption, the basic assumption that you want to keep, right, in the argument, how you define the intervals, uh, how, I mean, how you go from P1, from PI to PI plus one, or? Is well, it, it, of course, the, the basic idea is that you can pick these intervals small enough so that this condition is satisfied. And um, it's, so it's certainly they, these, these won't be satisfied as we're just for any arbitrary way of um, defining the interval. You, 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 um, and how, how small the interval has to be to get this um, condition satisfied. Um, it, it de yeah, it depends on the agent and the condition and, and all sorts of things. Uh, that's, that's why I call this an argument schema. Um, um, okay, now, I should say something about the, the concept of probability that's, that's most relevant here. Um, as well, the, co the concept of probability that has the, the best prospects for, for serving in, um, a, as it were, a scientific um, epistemology that, that might be a rival to, uh, to folk epistemology. I mean, I don't think that's the way it's going to go, but at least let's, let's give this idea some, a chance. Um, discussions of probability typically contrast two ideas. The, the idea of objective probability, uh, or often known as chance, and subjective probability, um, often known as credence, where Objective probability has to do with um, dispositions or propensities 
in nature itself. There's, no, there's, no, there's supposed to be nothing epistemological about objective probability. Um, and in fact, it seems if, if determinism is correct, then objective probability isn't really an interesting notion. All objective probabilities are either one or zero. But it might be that we live in a world, a quantum world, for example, where um, there are in genuine objective chances strictly between one and zero. Now, as I've just said, that's, that's clearly not an idea that is itself of direct epistemological significance. For example, a, a law of nature will have probability one in this sense. Um, there's no chance of it being false, even if we have as yet no evidence whatsoever for that, that that law of nature holds. Um, on the other hand, subjective probability just has to do with degrees of belief. Roughly speaking, degrees of belief are subject to certain uh, constraints of internal coherence or rationality. And again, although some people like Jeffries have, have tried to to base an epistemology purely on subjective probabilities. Um, it seems to me that if you really take the subjectiveness seriously, you're not going to get anything that has a decent chance of um, being a, a, a substitute epistemology because these, these subjective probabilities can be, can be crazy from an epistemological point of view. I mean, they can be... Um, object, you know, you can have subjective probabilities um, which give a, a subjective, you know, you can give subjective probability one to the being weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, okay, and that, I mean, you, you know, you can still satisfy all the probability axioms with, with that. Um, so, I mean, that's also not a, as we're an epistemologically sensible um, notion. I mean, I, it's not a notion that is equipped to play a, a central role in epistemology. I mean, it's, it's, a quick, it's really just a gravy version of the notion of belief. And we, we can't do epistemology just with the notion of belief. What we need is a kind of intermediate notion, which I call evidential probability. Um, it's something that's less objective than I, less agent independent than chance, but more objective than credence. So evidential probability has, has to do with the probability of theories or uh, hypotheses in general on, on our evidence. Right. So the, I mean, the idea is, well, the very best case for a hypothesis is that it's simply a logical consequence of our evidence. The worst case is that it's actually inconsistent with our evidence. But if we want to do something more fine-grained, then we want a whole lot of intermediate possibilities between those, where it's, it's we're neither strictly um, a logical consequence of our evidence, nor in, inconsistent with it, and yet we want to say of, of maybe of two hypotheses um, that are both in that intermediate situation, that somehow so one is closer to being inconsistent with our evidence than the other. And that's where the notion of evidential <laughs> probability comes in. That's the notion that I'm going to be talking about. Now, in Knowledge and Its Limits, I give a certain theory of what evidential probability is, that roughly speaking, it's some kind of um, prior probability conditionalized on our evidence where our evidence itself consists of everything that we know. So if that theory is right, the notion of evidential probability is itself a knowledge-based notion. But of course, if I assume that in the arguments of this paper, then the paper wouldn't really serve its purpose because I would be uh, bringing in knowledge to the understanding of evidential probability, and I wouldn't, as it were, be, be giving a real uh, independent argument for these, for these issues. Because uh, what, what I was trying, what I'm trying to do, 
is to show that even if we, as we bracket the notion of knowledge, we can still reconstruct the anti-luminosity considerations. So I'm going to use the notion of evidential probability, which is a kind of notion that as were, somebody who wants to do a prob probabilistic epistemology will need, without assuming that it has any particular relation to the notion of knowledge. I mean, I think it has, but I'm not going to assume that in these arguments in order to, as were, to be fair to the, the possibility that uh, there should be some sort of scientific uh, epistemology based on a notion of evidential probability that isn't itself based on the notion of, of knowledge. Okay. Right, well, now let me come on to the, the more detailed considerations of this framework. The, the handout makes it seem that the... the the talk is actually more, more technical than, uh, than it really is. I put it there so that you, you've got the more technical, or at least uh, some of the key technical details, but I'll, I'll just concentrate in a fairly sloppy way in this talk on um, underlying ideas. Now, the, the simplest analogue of the notion of luminosity within this probabilistic setting is, an, is the notion that I've called luminosity in probability one. Um, the beginning of the handout. Um, which is simply the result of replacing the notion of knowledge by the notion of prob probability one um, in the definition of luminosity. And what I've, what I've given in the first part of the handout is simply an, an exact analogue of the anti-luminosity argument with knowledge replaced by probability one. Um, now, is this, is this something that happened? Um, the key... point that we have to consider in assessing this argument is whether the analogue of this, the assumption here for probability one is <coughs> compelling. Um, so instead of your being, your knowing, we have there is probability one that you satisfy C. Um, Okay, well, let's, let's just uh, think about that. So suppose that at time ti plus 1, you do not satisfy C. Then it seems that at that very slightly earlier moment, there should be a non-zero probability that you don't satisfy C. Because if, the idea is, if you're at ti... You can't be absolutely certain that you're not at ti plus one because you can't you can't tell the difference between them it, it, because it's um, below your threshold of discrimination. I mean, I, a lot of the time I'll talk in terms of knowing, in effect, knowing what the time is. But you can think of that as just a kind of way of indexing knowing about um, all sorts of um, other variables like the temperature or the degree of pleasure or pain that you're feeling, whatever it is. Um, so, as it were, whatever is happening at ti plus one, that a moment before you can't be you can't be certain that it's not happening there. Um, or I mean, if we were doing the series in the opposite direction, it would be that a moment uh, if it if it had happened there, you could, um, couldn't be satisfied. You, you couldn't be certain a moment later that uh, it wasn't happening um, because. As it were, you, you, can't, you can't be certain exactly where you are in this series, either as a time series or as a series on some uh, dimension that's vary, varying gradually with time. Remember, all this is a description of the example. It depends on the particular kind of process that we've, we've hypothesized here. It's not, it's not claimed to be some kind of um, universal law. Okay. Now, that seems to be a pretty plausible claim. 
when we're talking about evidential probabilities. That we don't want an evidential probability um, of zero at time t i plus one that you satisfy c when it's so close to a case um, in which you don't satisfy c. So this this assumption seems pretty compelling, even when we think in terms of probability one. Um, Rather, and without any appeal to the notion of knowledge. And so given that this assumption is solid, the, the corresponding assumption that condition C is luminous in probability 1 must be false because it gets us to an absurdity by an argument of exactly the same structure as before. Okay. Um, now, of course, you might think, well... Shouldn't we react to that by going from probability 1 to some probability less than 1? Um, there are a number of things to, to say about that. One, one is that it it doesn't seem to correspond to the original motivation for postulating luminosity at all well. I mean, certainly, if you think in the, um, in the case of the one's awareness of one's own mental states, I mean, if, if luminosity had to be watered down to the claim that, for example, if you're in pain, um, there's a probability of at least... 0.9 on your evidence that you're in pain. I mean, that doesn't seem at all the kind of picture of mind that uh, people have wanted to defend when they made luminosity claims about um, one's own sensations. Um, and similarly, if one thinks in terms of the, the theory of rationality, um, I mean, if it was simply that I mean, suppose that rationality demanded something of you, um, which, you'd, which you didn't do, and there was a probability of, let's say, 0.9 on your evidence that rationality demanded that thing of you, then it still seems that you might not be criticisable for not doing it, because it might be that, as we were given a calculation of costs and benefits, it would... Um, it would be reasonable to, as were to, to take the risk, and um, because there was some non-zero uh, probability that doing this thing was uh, not inconsistent with the demands of rationality, and let's say there was some huge reward for, in other respects, for doing it. Um, so it seems that in terms of motivation, we, we need uh, probability uh, one there. Um, and we'll, we'll see some other, there are some other considerations that point that way as well. Um, now, the, the next thing I want to point out is that actually I've, I have rather oversimplified the, the way that we can map um, the considerations in terms of knowledge in, into probabilistic considerations, because um, and the mathematics of probability really puts some quite tight constraints on us. And in effect, what I've been what I've been saying is, if you're at a, a point at point ti, then there's a non-zero probability that you're at ti plus one, because that's within the threshold of your discrimination. But assuming that, that time is continuous, or actually it would just be enough for it to be, to be dense, I mean, so that for, between any two points of time there's another point, that, by the same token, there should also be a probability of more than zero that you're at any time between ti and ti plus one. I mean, for any particular moment between these two times, there should be a, a non-zero probability that you're there. In fact, um, 
assuming that this is a, some kind of monotonic process, so just a one-directional dire process, um, if you're at TI, actually, the probability that you're at T should be at least as great as the probability that you're at TI plus one. Um, but if you think about it, the mathematics of that won't work out because we've got, we've got in, infinitely many points in between TI and TI plus one, all of which would have to have a probability at least as much as that of TI plus one, which we're assuming is non-zero, and you can't have a whole lot of, um, you can't have infinitely many uh, non-zero quantities, all greater than some, I mean, all, whole infinitely many quantities, all greater than some non particular non-zero quantity, i.e. the probability that you're at Ti plus one, adding up to one, which probabilities have got to do. Um, so, things are actually a little bit more complicated than I've been letting on so far. Um, we, we could try to do some fancy footwork with infinitesimal probabilities or with uh, probabilities conditional on event, uh, events of probability zero and things. But I, I want to do this in a somewhat more orthodox way, so that I'm not, as it were, giving hostages to fortune by using some kind of non-standard probability theory. Um, so I think if, if one's thinking in um, more standard probabilistic terms, uh, the, the natural way to think is that the, the only hypotheses that we can assume to have a, a non-zero probability, are hypotheses which are true in some interval, throughout some interval of non-zero of non length. Okay. Um, so, so the idea would be that if you're at, I mean actually if you're at some point t, um, and let's now call the threshold of discrimination corresponding to the distance between ti and ti plus one. Let's say that that's epsilon. Um, so suppose that you're at t and some condition c holds throughout an interval of greater than zero length that's within an epsilon of t. Then at t you must have a probability greater than zero that C holds. Um, now, in effect, that allows us to reconstruct the anti-luminosity argument. Um, because if you take if you take condition one um, on, the, the, on the sort of lower half of the first page of the handout. Um, it's saying, suppose, we can think of, can think of it as the, the other way. Suppose that we've got an, uh, an interval from T to um, T level star, throughout which we have um, not C holding. Um, then if you think about the, the slightly longer interval that goes from T minus epsilon to T double star plus epsilon, then anywhere in that longer interval you're within an epsilon of a, an interval of greater than zero length throughout which not C holds. I mean, if you just think about it, you, you see why that is the case. And therefore, we can't have condition C having probability one anywhere throughout this longer interval. Um, 
if you if you combine that with the assumption that C is luminous in probability one, you can you can fairly easily see that what you, what you get is an argument that says if the, if C sorry well, let's holds nowhere in this, this interval here, I not C holds throughout this interval here, then not C also holds throughout this slightly longer interval here. And that enables us to give the same kind of Sorites argument, because it says if you can find some tiny little interval throughout which not C holds, then it will also hold throughout a bigger interval by a bigger by an epsilon, and then you can just repeat that argument as many times as you need to show that that not C hold, holds throughout some longer and longer interval. And then, of course, given this initial setup, that will eventually lead to a reductio ad absurdum simply by iterating the uh, argument often enough. Um, we we did have to to start with a slightly stronger assumption. We not just the assumption. Well, that we that we had not C holding at a particular point. What we needed was the assumption that there was no, some there was some interval of non-zero length throughout which not C held. But if you think about the the cases that we're actually interested in, that's in fact an extremely innocuous assumption. Right? Um, for example. I mean, if you're, I mean, suppose that C is the condition of being in pain, then what we need is that there's some tiny interval, maybe, you know, a, a millionth of a second, throughout which you were not in pain. Right? Now, I mean, life is pretty bad, but it's not so bad that we can't realise that, that uh, assumption. Okay, so I don't think we've really seriously weakened the argument for practical uh, purposes by, um, by doing it that way. Um, so th that might make you think, well, perhaps we should go back to the idea of luminosity in um, probability less than one. I mean, you know, luminosity, uh, luminosity in probability 0.9 or something like that, if we're having so much trouble with luminosity in probability 1. Um, but actually, we, um, there's a reason why going down to some threshold less than one probably wouldn't help very much. Um, I mean, suppose, for example, that we were considering luminosity in probability 0.9. So in other words, we're considering the, uh, the constraint that in every case in which C obtains, the probability that C obtains is at least 0.9. Now, and we, we just have this process of gradual change. Now, for at least a lot of these examples, it doesn't have to hold in all the examples, but in quite a lot of these examples, there's going to be a certain kind of symmetry in the process. So that roughly speaking, your, your discrimination is equal on the, in the two directions, in the sense that um, if, if you're actually let's say if, if the temperature is actually a certain, um, a certain point, then it's equally likely for you that it's a little bit more than that or that it's a bit, little bit less than that. Right. Okay. So, so if you consider um, some case where we've got, let's say, uh, C holding up to here and not C holding here, and we're at some... <coughs> And supposing we're at some point on the C side, that's time t. So that means that there's a probability 
of a half that we're on this side of t and a probability of a half that we're on that side of t. Okay, because we know, that we, we know roughly where we are, but we, as well, we know in effect that we're somewhere around t, but, the, but it, we could be anywhere in some little interval around here. And there's no, there's no particular asymmetry here. Right? Now, the probability of c is going to be, well, on that side, c holds everywhere. On this side, it just holds um, in this little bit. Okay, let's call, let's call the probability of that x. So the probability of c at this time t is 0.5 plus x. Okay, now by taking t closer and closer to the cutoff point, we can make x as small as we like. Right. So actually, um, we're not even going to get probability in, I mean, luminosity in probability 0.9 or 0.6 or whatever, because um, if we tried to have, let's say, it luminous in, in probability 0.6, it would have to be that whenever C held, there was a probability of at least 0.6 that it held. But by taking T closer and closer to the cutoff here, we can reduce X below 0.1 and therefore refute the hypothesis that uh, C is luminous, even in probability 0.6. So actually reducing to probabilities below 1, it's not really going to, to help with the problem. Okay. Now, actually, I've, is it okay if I talk for another 10, 10 minutes or, or whatever? Um, there's, there's one further idea that I want to explore briefly as a, a way out of these considerations, uh, which is... <coughs> goes via the, the notion of expectation, where the, the expectation of a variable is its um, probability, um, sorry, it's, it's, it's average value weighted by the probabilities of the different possibilities. So, for example, if, if it had a... Um, if you had some variable that had a, a probability of a third of being um, 7 and two thirds of being 15, then the um, expected value would be a third times 7 plus two thirds times 15. I mean, you should off when you get it. Now, there's a kind of probabilistic substitute for the idea of luminosity, which says, suppose that we had a variable <coughs> whose value was always equal to its expected value, then that would be rather like luminosity, because as it, were, it would, would mean that if we did calculations with this um, variable, if, if we just put in its expected value, that would, that would give us the right result. Now you might think, surely that's isn't that just the same thing as luminosity? But it isn't. It isn't quite. And I'll, I'll give you an example to show how you can have this weaker condition without having luminosity, uh, without having luminosity in probability one. Um, suppose this is just a kind of a very schematic toy model. Suppose we're just talking about um, beliefs about what the time is. And let's just think, to make everything very, very simple, that um, time is ordered now like, with like the positive and negative integers. And so if you're at a time t, then there's a probability of a, th of a third that the time is t. There's a probability of a third that it's t minus 1, and there's a probability of a third that it's t plus 1. So as we're, if you're at a given time, it's equally likely that you're at, at any one of the three times around it. Okay, so there's, there's just a little bit of uncertainty about exactly what the time is. Now, so th this, is, this is a case where the condition that these, the time is a given t is not at all, 
it's not luminous in probability one because if it holds, the probability that it holds is a third. However, the expectation of the time is always the time itself because the, at time t, the expectation of the time is a third times t minus one plus a third times t plus a third times t plus one and that does come out the same as, as t. Um, so ex the, expect the expected time is always the actual time, even though you're, not, you're never sure what the actual time is. Um, you, might, you might think that that's not really a coherent setup, because you might think but surely, once, and given that the expected time is t, we must be able to deduce from that that the time is t, right? because the only time at which the expected time is t is t itself. But that argument is a fallacy, because it, what it incorrectly takes for granted is that you, you can know or you or give probability one to what the expected time is and the uh, the expected time is just as much in doubt in this example as the actual time um, of course in a way that that's already a hint of what of why this might not this idea might not really help very much, but um, but it, it it does it does show this, that you can have perfectly coherent models in which um, we we do have the expectation of a variable always being identical with that variable, even though you never know exactly what the value of the variable is. Um, what I'm arguing in the in the, the paper, which I, I, I can't really go into m much detail about now because there isn't time. I mean, by the way, the, the, you, can get to the, you can get the paper from my website if you want to see proper details. Um, is that even this idea isn't really going to help very much. Um, the... <coughs> I mean, the calculations with expectations are more complicated, so uh, in general one tends to need rather to make more assumptions about the nature of the models simply in order to be able to do the calculations. But the kind of model which I think is not totally unrealistic, um, I mean, as it were, is at least a, an, an approximation to lots of real situations, um, is one in which um, you've got a space of, of possible states. And I'll, the simplest case is where we've got a finite um, space. And between any two states, you can get from any state to any other state in the state space by transitions where if, if you're at one point, let's say W, I'm calling it, Wi's. If you're at a state Wi, then the probability that you're in Wi plus one is non-zero. So as it were, there's a, you can have a. And the idea is, in these models, from any point in the state space, you can get to any other point by a finite series of transitions, where at each stage you're going to uh, a state which has a non-zero probability of obtaining from the one that you're at. Right. So it's it's not unlike these kind of sorites series is just a, a sort of generalization of that. And what you can show is in, in finite examples, um, the only traces where this condition that the expectation of, of, X, of the variable x is always the same as x, the only cases where that can hold are cases where x is constant. Um, I, it has the same value in all states. 
And the, the basic idea is it's going to have a ma it's going, uh, the value the, the variable is going to attain a maximum somewhere in this um, state space. And you can never go from a point at, at which the variable attains its maximum to a point to which its value is less than its maximum by a transition of this kind where you're going to um, a, a state of, of non-zero probability because if you're going, if, if a state of uh, non-zero probability had the variable having less than its maximum value, then its expected value would be less than its maximum value back here, which would, given that it's supposed to have its maximum value here and the ex expected and actual values are the same, would be that you had a contradiction. That's, I mean, that's very brief, but that, um, that can, you can either take the mathematics on trust or, or we can talk about it afterwards. Um, and even in infinite tree models, although you, you need a bit, a bit more assumptions because the probability probability on infinite state spaces is always more complicated. Um, something like that uh, goes on. Um, there's, there's one final thing that you, you might think, which is, you might think, well, okay, so th these analogues of luminosity in probabilistic terms don't really seem to be working. But couldn't we rather, instead of that, have a conception on which we can get closer and closer to the ideal of luminosity without ever actually getting there. So um, couldn't we have a... We start with a variable x, which is just as it were something in the world, then we take its expectation, which is um, a bit more epistemological than X itself, but still, as we're not very luminous. And then, but then, if we're going in the direction of luminosity, couldn't we then take the expectation of its expectation and, um, and so on? And as well, wouldn't, wouldn't we, by doing this, be gradually getting closer and closer to the original ideal of luminosity? Um, by the way, in talking about expectations of expectations <coughs> and so on, where in effect we're talking about um, probabilities of probabilities. And the conceptualizing the higher order probabilities of that kind does require considerable care. I mean, if you've done some, some mathematics of probability theory, you, you're probably expecting that the expectation of the expectation of x would have to be the same as the expectation of x. But it, in fact, once you consider the kind of... You take seriously the kind of variation in evidential probabilities across the state space, you, you have to think of it a different way. I can talk about, more about that in discussion, uh, too. So, and so the, all that... The, the bit of semantics on the second page of the handout is just... There, if, you, if, you, if you're not worried about higher, how to conceptualize higher probabilities, you can ignore it. But it's there to show that, the, that you, you really can <coughs> do this in a uh, conceptually coherent way. Um, so you might think, isn't this a kind of series that's going in the direction of greater and greater luminosity, even if the ideal itself is somehow unrealizable? But there are results in probability theory, which um, suggests that something <coughs> is, is wrong with this conception. The I mean, simplest case to consider, again, is the case where we have a finite number of states. And what you can, what you can show is, given the kind of the assumption which I'm calling Sorites on the second page, I mean, the assumption, that, that's the assumption that you can get um, from any point in the state space to any other point via a series of uh, transitions, always to, to states of non-zero probability. Um, you can show that whatever variable x we have, um, given, given this assumption about the, uh, uh, the structure of the state space, this series of variables the original variable is expectation, the expectation is expectation, and so on, converges to a limit 
that is independent of the point in the state space that you started from. So wherever you were in the state space, this, you will, this series will converge to the same limit. And what that actually means is that the, the difference between different points in the state space is gradually being washed out as you, take, as you iterate the process of taking expectations. You see, within this kind of setting where we're talking about variables rather than conditions, variables that can take any real value, the equivalent of a trivial condition is a constant variable, I, a variable which has the same value at all points in the state space. Because a constant variable, in that sense, is one that tells you nothing about where you are in the state space. The, po the epistemic possibilities that you start with, what you're supposed to be doing is gradually working out where you are in the state space. But if, if what you're doing is trying to approximate along here, you're, you're, going, you're trying to approximate... I mean, the process of approximation is taking you to in the direction of less and less informative variables. And, I mean, of course, that, I mean, that does depend on the, the particular structure of the state, state space. But I, I, th I think the, those assumptions are a sufficiently good approximation for this to be quite a good indicative case. But the whole ideal of luminosity is one which is, by taking us towards this imp impossible ideal, is, is gradually wiping out the very differences in evidence that are what we require to, in order to learn from experience. So that I think we're left in a somewhat uneasy position in epistemology. I mean, I mean this is simply, the, as it were, the predicament that we are, are in effect, all in, where um, there's, I mean, there's no point in doing epistemology, as it were, with, with notions which have n no epistemological privilege at all, e.g. simply with the notion of truth. I mean, because that's not epistem I mean, there's nothing particularly epistemological about that. Whereas if we try to, uh, to give too much epistemological <coughs> privilege to the, the notions that we're uh, working with, as we do with uh, the, the notion of luminosity, or even with the notion of, as we're trying to approximate to luminosity, we, we, we wind up with constraints so demanding that the only things that can meet them are, are things which undermine the possibility of learning from experience. So that we, the notions that we need in epistemology are intermediate notions that as it were, have some kind of epistemological privilege, but only of a, an extremely approximate kind. And it seems to me that the, the notion of knowledge um, is, in fact, really quite well suited to play that role because on the one hand where it is somewhat more um, agent dependent than the mere notion of truth in fact considerably so and yet it's it's not one which as it were is somehow purely internal to the uh, the agent because it, because there are there is a truth constraint on knowledge although there are also as it were if you like agent dependent constraints and so the, the kind of that kind of intermediate position isn't just some pathology of folk epistemology. It's actually exactly what we need in order to do epistemology properly. Right. Sorry for going over the time. <laughs>
knowledge first, uh, the fact that you can adduce consideration of anti-luminosity even for the case where it is supposed not to work, that is, for notions which have to do, where, where we want to replace the notion of knowledge by the notion of degree of belief, uh, and where probability consideration abound. Now, but at the same time, I was wondering whether this strategy that you gave us today doesn't also weaken uh, your, uh, your point against uh, the, the people who want to do their epistemology in terms of some notion of rational belief. Because uh, they could say, these people could say, well, given that um, we can use the same anti-luminosity arguments for uh, our, our framework, what is the point of uh, uh, replacing the notion of rational belief or starting epistemology with the notion of uh, rational belief uh, in, instead of the notion of knowledge? I mean, uh, couldn't your... Do you mean what's the point of starting yeah, with the notion of knowledge rather than with yes. the notion of rational belief? Because, for instance, uh, of course, uh, a Bayesian in general would use consideration of probability not only with respect to the notion of belief, but also with respect to the connection of belief to action. And uh, the, the, there are some people who, who, who want to have some intermediary notion of evidential probability by not uh, hooking their, their, their degrees of credence uh, to action of the agent. I mean, for instance, I'm, I'm thinking of people like Rich, uh, James Joyce, uh, mm. not the old mm. uh, the Buck, Buck Merlin guy, <laughs> but uh, the, the man from Michigan. Um, so, so, I mean, do, it seems that you have done uh, a step uh, in, in the direction of such people who would be sophisticated Bayesian and who would say that, uh, <coughs> well, fine, I mean, we, we, are, we agree, we, we, we can make it in one framework or another. And therefore, what, be, what becomes of your, uh, of your strategy of putting knowledge uh, in, the, uh, in, the pri in, in the primary position in epistemology? Because um, if, if you can give the same arguments with, with, with probability consideration, uh, what is the point? And that's related to something which you, which I'd like to, which is more, uh, which is a point which has been very often discussed about the reliability, the um, luminosity argument. You said it is very important for you not to reintroduce the notion of knowledge uh, when uh, you, 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 you mount your argument. But nevertheless, didn't you rely at one point or another on, upon the notion of reliability. I mean, the, 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 you, you said that the, the kind of beliefs that, um, the, 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 the kind of probability assignment that we have here uh, are not connected to any sort of, um, of law. But nevertheless, uh, it seems that some notion of reliability is embedded in even uh, the notion of belief. Yeah, yeah, no, I do. Um, well, I mean, for, just specifically about reliability, I, I would have thought that, as were proponents of some kind of um, eliminativist um, or um, scientific epistemology, or or, uh, or one which at least would replace uh, folk epistemology, would would want. Uh, to be able to use the notion of reliability, I mean, it would, I mean, no doubt, as it were, some, some suitably scientific version of it. But, but I mean, it doesn't it, it, I don't think it's, it's illegitimate for them to uh, appeal to considerations of that kind. Um, yeah, what I was, what I was doing here was assuming that we have sufficient intuitive grasp of the notion of evidential probability. Um, to to make these arguments without any particular theory of what evi as well where evidential probabilities uh, come from. Now, of course, if if that was all that I had, 
then I think what one would get, one would get from this is that the anti-luminosity considerations were robust, but that they simply didn't need to be done in terms of knowledge at all. Um, but I'm I'm not, as it were, withdrawing the part of the book in which I argue that actually the, the notion of evidential probability must be interpreted in terms of knowledge. It's simply that I, I'm, I didn't want to uh, assume that. Um, and I, I mean, as we're just to give us a hint as to what, what the argument is. Um, when, when you read the Bayesian accounts of epistemology, typically what is lacking um, is an account of where evidence comes from. For example, um, the sort of thing that you get in Bayesian epistemology is you get arguments, let's say, for e.g. about the, the washing out of priors, so that uh, arguments to, to show that if two people start with different prior probabilities, but then they, then they keep um, updating their probabilities on the basis of the same sequence of evidence, then they'll converge to the same, pro the same probabilities. Um, but but it's, within the Bayesian tradition, you're typically s simply not told anything about what this evidence is. Mm -hmm. And wh what, I, what I argue in the book um, is that the, the notion that, that, I mean, the best hypothesis about what the evidence is, is simply that it's knowledge, and that if, if, you, if, you try, if you try to give a more subjective account of evidence as simply something like belief or ob belief in observational propositions or whatever, you'll, you'll just get uh, epistemologically implausible re uh, results. Um, okay, so... So that the, as the, the, the Bayesians, are, in the end, they're going to need a notion of, of knowledge to, to fill out a decent theory of, of evidential uh, probability. I mean, that's, as I say, that's not something that I've argued um, in, in this talk. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, let, I mean, perhaps that will, that will do for the um, I'm sure I've not understood everything about the relationship between the original uh, anti luminosity argument and this the, the new one, which is very interesting. So let, let me just make a start in the right direction for me. Uh, so, um, so you have probabilistic marginal for error principles like um, 1i, so t i the probability of c of tens is 1, then t i plus 1 c of tens. So I reckon that, I mean, the, these principles are, of course, relative to one's evidence. Uh, for instance, the evidence given by one's uh, feeling plane, is that right? I mean, because you, you could imagine that, for instance, God talks to me, where she to insist, yeah. and uh, God, I mean the borderline, borderline case of uh, pain, uh, so I don't know that I'm in pain, because uh, <coughs> the, the margin of error principle is unsatisfied. Mm. Nevertheless, God talks to me and tells me that I'm in pain, and I yeah. trust him. And in that case, you don't have the, the margin of error principle. I mean, Sure. So, okay, yeah. Then I have two questions yeah. after that. But I mean, the, the first question is: What, what if I both feel pain and God tells me that uh, I'm? Uh, okay. So anyway, I mean, anyway. Yeah. The, the well, but I mean, this is this. I mean, the, the, the crucial thing to remember is that one eye is just a description of 
the example in, in question. And the, the example that I was using was one that, as it were, by stipulation, did not involve any supernatural interference. Um, and, you know, I mean, luminosity and probability one, like ordinary luminosity, is it's a universal claim about the condition. So to refute it, I only need one counterexample. Right? So, it's, so as it were, it's legitimate for me to, to describe an example that suits my purposes, Provi I mean, provided that I um, do that in a, a coherent way. And I, I mean, you know, just, just um, excluding the deus ex machina, is, I, I think is a, a legitimate stipulation about a particular example. I mean, marginally, if you, what do you think of the strategy which, which would, uh, I mean, take very seriously the fact that these mounting fire principles are relative to evidence, I mean, to, for instance, giving back one's, one's uh, feeling pain. But then when you try to plug the consequence of uh, principles such as one uh, back into, when I mean, you try to apply the same margin for your principle again to the consequence, You've changed the evidence because now the evidence is not only one's feeling pain, but one's feeling pain plus one's knowledge of the margin for the principle. And well, I don't know if it could be done, but don't you think that there might be a way to block the arguments? I mean, of course, there's an analog way to do this in the original uh, anti luminosity argument. So I'm trying to, to make clear what that, what, what's the relationship between uh, both. I mean, are you allowed just to plug the consequence of when you when you've proven, for instance, that uh, at t i plus one c obtains? Yeah. Then I guess you want to apply the same margin for your principle to that and have a kind of a reductio argument. Yeah, sure. But when you say the, I mean, remember that it's this argument is carried out in a setting which makes explicit allowance for the probabilities to change over time. Okay. I mean, that, so in a way, that's partly what it's about. Um, so, you know, if, if one expanded the probability that C obtains to the probability on one's evidence at time Ti that C obtains, it wouldn't make any difference to the argument at all. Um, and, I mean, that, that probability is a, a, it's a probability on all your evidence, okay? So what, whatever evidence you have, including any evidence that you have um, about your own powers of discrimination, that's, that's all, to, as it were, that's all incorporated into these probabilities, which is the way that one usually thinks about evidential probabilities. That's not um, some special uh, assumption of mine. But the evidence is not the same from the start. Uh, the evidence, of course, the, ev the evidence is, the evidence is, well, when you say, do you mean the start of the process or the start of the argument? Just, I mean, the start from one uh, eye, for instance. Yeah, but I mean, sure, the... The subject's evidence is changing over time, but that's what the argument is about. I mean, it's not, it's not an argument that ignores that. It's an argument which is specifically, as it were, directed to questions about how or how not um, that, that evidence and probabilities based on it are, are changing. So, I mean, it's, I don't think any, I mean, no, no modification of the argument is needed to acknowledge the fact that the, that the evidence Okay. I don't want to go on, but ju just, I mean, if you say that the evidence changes, then you need slightly different margin for your principles at each uh, step of the argument. So, well, which is an objection, but it's just... Uh, but, uh, no, I, I, I don't see that one needs different margins for I mean, of course, it, it could be that, I mean, no, no doubt it, it is, that in, in, in some of these processes, uh, one of the things that's changing is the subject's own powers of discrimination, right? I mean, for example, you could have we could have one of these series where 
T0 is when you're just waking up at the in the morning when your powers of discrimination are extremely low and then gradually, uh, by Tn, you know, you're wide awake, you've had your coffee and so on, and, and so your powers of discrimination are, are higher. Um, and in, in a case like that, we, we have to make sure that the, the intervals are chosen close enough together so that, um, so that we're, we're always under the, um, the threshold of discrimination. But then, I mean, we could do that because we can simply um, take the threshold of discrimination at the point at which um, your powers of discrimination are at their maximum and then use that one throughout the series. And then it'll, as it were, that will mean earlier on in the series we've got points which are unnecessarily close together, but that won't do any harm to the argument. It'll just mean that you need more steps to, to get to the conclusion. Just to uh, echo the events of the jazz ball, because of the argument. Um, but um, I want to be sure um, to understand uh, uh, particularly the anti-luminosity argument in probability less than zero, then less than one, because I, I yeah. follow and I'm very convinced with your argument from pro for probability one, luminosity probability yeah. one. Um, so before the question, so just one um, remark you made that surprised me, that you said that uh, um, rationality requires uh, luminosity and probability one, or that it seemed that that was really uh, the um, probability that one wanted to make, and if the probability is uh, 0 0.9, um, one wouldn't be um, charged of irrationality if he, uh, if he became, you know, well, if, uh, for what he had uh, such a low probability. Um, it just seems counterintuitive, so it, um, um, it, to me, the, the idea of luminosity and probability less than one, um, pri prima facie, seems an idea that one would want to um, um, develop. So um, now, um, it's just the argument that um, I'm not sure I have completely um, followed, and if you'd be kind enough just to go to the, yeah. um, to the argument itself, and the and one thing, so just to keep in mind what confuses me is, again, so the the evidential probability, you, if, if the argument were made as you just of a subjective probability, yeah. I would perfectly follow and be convinced, but you um, have this idea of evidential probability and I'm not completely um, sure how the argument goes there, I guess. Okay, um, th let me just say so, w w w something about the motivation and then something about the, the argument. Um, <coughs> I mean, here's a kind of more intuitive w way to think about the motivation. Um, su suppose that um, we're doing the, exactly the kind of um, probabilistic calculation that um, some sort of Bayesian theory of rationality tells us that we ought to do, so that, so that we're working out you know, we're working out the expectation of x by, you know, by, you know, doing some calculation like the probability um, that x equals seven is a third, and um, the, sorry, the probability that x equals fifteen is two thirds, and then then we do the calculation. Now. Suppose that these claims were themselves only probable, right? Suppose that the probability, that actually there was, there was a probability of um, you know, uh, the, the probability of that being a third was, um, was a half, and then there was a probability of a quarter that it was a bit more than that, and a probability of you know, of course, a bit less than, then it seems that, as it were, it's not really this calculation that we should be doing, but, but one with these second-order probabilities. And then if the second-order probabilities were themselves subject to uncertainty, it seems that we ought to be doing a, prob a calculation with third-order probabilities. And if the third-order order probabilities were themselves subject to uncertainty, we ought to be doing one with fourth-order probabilities. And so 
it's actually extremely hard to, to see how one can be, as it were, how the theory of rationality, you know, within this kind of way of thinking, can be satisfactorily done with probabilities if those probabilities are themselves subject to uncertainty. Sorry, so there is, there is a kind of motivation for not wanting to have any uncertainty about the probabilities themselves. Okay, so that's one form of wanting luminosity and probability one. Now, about the way that the argument goes, um, I mean, let, so the idea was that, um, I mean, let, let's just make some um, simplifying assumptions. So I, I'm, I'm assuming that at T, the, I mean, this is, this is simplifying even more than I did, I mean, did here, just to get a kind of model to, to show what's going on. I'm assuming that at T, uh, probabilities are uniformly distributed over the interval from T minus epsilon to T plus epsilon. It's a bit, I mean, maybe a bit crude, but so as it were, we, in effect, what, in, you know that you're somewhere in that interval, and you could be anywhere in that interval. And that, um, now, suppose that um, we let's let's suppose we've got a condition C that um, holds from from time t, um, t zero to time t k, and then not c holds from t k on to the t n. <coughs> um, now, suppose that where, suppose that t is we're very close to t k <clears throat> but just a little bit short of it, so it's tk minus delta, um, then the, so we've got at tk, we've, sorry, yes, okay, sorry. So at t, we've got these probabilities distributed here. Now, the probability at time t that c obtains, well, it's, um, the probability at t that um, where between t minus epsilon and t plus the probability that where between t and Tk, okay, because um, Tk is where C stops holding. Now, this probability, um, the first of these is a, is a half, and the second of these is well, the, the the length of this interval between T and Tk. Since we chose T T to be Tk minus delta, that's um, delta as a proportion of the overall length of the interval, which is to epsilon. And now epsilon is fixed, okay, but we can choose delta to be as small as we like. So, so we can take this probability of C at T to be, we can make it as close to a half as we like. Okay, so um, if, if our original constraint had been that luminosity and probability 0 0.6 or 0 0.7, mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. by choosing delta small enough to make this, this term be less than 0 0.1 or 0 0.2, we would refute that hypothesis. Okay, that's, that's the structure of the argument. And then um, the way I was doing it, you could actually... I, I was actually using somewhat less restrictive assumptions about the probability, but I think the, the basic idea is already contained in, 
brief question on your um, reply to the first part of my question. Yeah. So it's um, why uh, we need probability one yeah. for rationality. Um, so the, the the point is that if we have if we can iterate uncertainties yeah. uh, ad infinitum, we, we can get the theory of rationality. But the problem with that is you need an uh, um, end point in iterating uncertainties about probability to start reason yeah. um, and that's not quite the same thing as requiring <laughs> probability so it, oh, okay so that would be just asking that you have probability one at some point and then you, your argument uh, well, well did you see what then but I mean what, what I but the, the requirement I mean the the idea was As well, the kind of thinking that motivates the claims of luminosity involves the idea that we, where there's uncertainty in the, as well, the rationality considerations, then strictly speaking, what we ought to be doing is to be factoring in that uncertainty into our calculations. And so it seems that as well, in order to do the calculate, Whatever calculations we do using some probabilistic notions, so we'll have to write down some probabilities at some point. Those probabilities will have to be written down using, I mean, in terms of some notion of probability that isn't subject to this higher order uncertainty. Um, and so it seems that, that what's required is that there be some notion of probability not subject to higher order uncertainty. And whatever, whatever that notion is, is the source of the anti-luminosity. Sorry, I mean, this is, it's a source of luminosity claims, and then it's, and then it's the target of the anti-luminosity yeah. argument. Thank you.